Welcome to Writer Mother Monster. I'm your host, Lara Ehrlich, and our guest tonight is Sarah Hosey. Before I introduce Sarah, thank you all for joining me. Um, whether you are listening after the fact on Audible or wherever you get your, uh, your podcasts or joining us live tonight, um, if you didn't know, this podcast is recorded live um, and is streamed on Facebook and YouTube. So you can find us here every week at 6 p.m. Eastern and chat with us in real time or listen to the podcast after the fact anywhere you find your podcasts. So again, my guest tonight is Sarah Hosey. Sarah is the author of an academic study of representations of women in popular culture called Home is Where the Heart Hurt is, Media Depictions of Wives and Mothers, as well as two young adult novels, Iphigenia Murphy, which came out last year, and Imagining Elsewhere, which is forthcoming this summer. Sarah's fiction has also appeared in the Running Wild Press novella anthology, as well as publications including Cordella Literary and North by Northeast Literary Magazine. Her screenplay adaptation of Iphigenia Murphy was a semi-finalist at the Austin Film Festival and came in third place in the Reading Film Fest screenwriting competition. She has a PhD in American literature and is a professor of English, creative writing, and women and gender studies at a New York area community college. She has an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old, and she and her partner are certified foster parents. They recently had a 4-year-old foster daughter staying with them. Sarah describes writer motherhood in three words as fun, flow, finite. Please join me in welcoming Sarah. Thank you so much, Lara. I am a fan of this podcast and of your short story collection, Animal Wife. So I'm I'm so pleased to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, I, as I told you before the show, I'm a fan of yours as well. And I have to thank you for suggesting that before I introduce you, I let people know that this is also a live show every week um, in case those who listen as a podcast didn't realize that because mm -hmm. perhaps I have never actually mentioned that. So thank you. No problem. I, I, I'm a listener and I did not know. So yeah, that's no, it's no. <laughs> one of those like obvious things that you don't think about until someone with a fresh pair of eyes mentions it. So, yeah, so thank sure. you. Um, and let's start with the three words that you use to describe writer motherhood. Again, those are fun, flow, finite. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to start with the last one, finite. And I think, you know, again, I'm a listener. So I think you have a one-year-old. Is that around a one-year-old? He's five now. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I Maybe maybe somebody, some other guest had a one-year-old. Oh, yeah. No, well, we've had a range of, of ages. So. <laughs> So five is a, is kind of a magic number, and um, and I'm here to tell you from the other side of five that it's it gets so much easier. That you, there will be a day. Now I'll, I'll make a blanket disclaimer before we begin that I realize that all kids are different and all families are different. But I would say for the most part, you know, most of our kids will shower themselves and wipe their own behinds and. <laughs> And even like, uh, you know, my 11 year old woke up this morning, we had the day off for Veterans Day and he, he read in bed, you know, like I didn't have to get up and read to him. So I think when you're in the thick of it, uh, it's hard to imagine those days, but it's finite really. And, and it's, it's such the, so many cliches about parenthood are true. <laughs> so um, as much as it's difficult to find the fun, you know, when your kids are small, I do think that uh, when it gets frustrating, maybe that should have been the other F word I used, when it gets frustrating, you can remember it's finite. And a, a wise parent once said to me when my kids were little, like, you know, whatever behavior you see, whether it's a good behavior or a bad behavior, like she's a great eater or he's a bad sleeper, just when you have kind of finally, uh, you know, incorporated it and made your peace with it, it will change. Your good eater will be a terrible eater and you're, you're, Terrible sleeper, hopefully will someday be a good sleeper. So it's all finite. And I think both on the macro and the micro, we have to remember that, that 
you know, uh, I did have a terrible sleep for one of my kids for like almost a year. He was up every night. He was up every night. And it, um, it became one of these situations where, uh, we just kept waiting for it to end. You know, he was old enough. I think he was out of his crib, but so he was old enough to kind of get up and walk around, but still so little that that was incredibly dangerous. So we just wrestled with this for months and months. And it was a situation in which we, we finally said, okay, we need to make an appointment with a sleep clinic. Okay. So after months of going through this, so we make an appointment with a sleep clinic and, um, they're, they're booked six months out. So we make that six month out, you know, appointment. And I think it was like five months and two weeks. He started sleeping through the night, <laughs> like no problem, you know, and, and it really hasn't been a, a problem since then. But I tell this story again, because I remember, you know, sitting up with him and, and thinking you have to sleep sometime. And they do, they do have to sleep. It's, it's finite. They will go to sleep. They will use the potty. They will shower themselves. It's all finite. So if you can kind of get uh, into the flow, that's the, my other word, which is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I think it um, is relevant both to parenthood and writing. Um, the idea of when you get into that state where you forget that you're doing something. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think especially like it's it, for me, it's very analogous in the sense that like I don't necessarily want to sit down and write. But once I get there, I, I'm, I'm in flow and I'm enjoying it and I'm and I forget what I'm doing. And sometimes with parenting, I think it's the same. You you may have other you might be wanting to check your email or take your shower or talk to your friend. Um, but once you get into it, once you start playing the game or or just whatever it is, going to the zoo, enjoying the zoo, enjoying the Avengers movie, uh, you get into the flow and that's where happiness is. And I and. Uh, there's a psychologist and whose name I'm going to, I have it written down phonetically in front of me, but it's uh, Chick sent me Hai. He's, uh, he's a psychologist who studies the concept of flow. I think he kind of originated the way that we talk about flow. And um, his idea is that the happiest people are those who have something in their life that permits them to um, experience flow. So whether that's writing or baseball or being with your kids, that these are the moments that that keep us happy because we can we can forget ourselves and and kind of just be alive and experiencing something that we enjoy so flow in parenthood i think is uh what maybe we all are looking for and not always attaining but uh but trying to get to yeah no that sounds very wise and it's i think hand in hand with being present mm -hmm. which um i know i have a lot of trouble with and i'm sure a lot of parent listeners probably do as well that sense of like being present with your child um uh, and not thinking about other things namely writing like how do you how do you sort of be present with your child and be happy that you're there and that don't feel as though you should be doing something else mm -hmm. and vice versa with writing like really being present with the work and not worrying about whether you know hopefully your child's like safe and and that's <laughs> taken care of but like not worrying about your child while you're writing yeah have you found a way to do that well, that's, it's interesting because this is uh, this you, you asked the question that I that I, is really so dear to my heart. Um, and again, my kids are in school now, so I have a different schedule. But when my youngest was six months old, he started daycare, mm -hmm. and um, we I am fortunate enough I teach at Nassau Community College, and we have a daycare on campus called the Children's Greenhouse. And I have thanked the greenhouse and the two books I've published since my children. Uh, have been born because uh, I knew that my kids were safe and having an awesome time there. Um, there's a few things I'd like to say. One is that I remember another parent, and it's interesting to me even reflecting uh, in preparation for tonight, how much of what I learned as a parent was said like in an offhanded kind of way by other parents that they probably don't even remember saying these things to me, but they they, I, they, I sat with them and I thought about them and I often really uh, integrated them into like very deliberately into my parenting. But a woman I work with, Kristen, had older an older kid who had gone through the greenhouse. And I remember saying to her, I didn't have mom guilt about daycare, but I remember saying, like, do you think about your kid during the day when he's at the greenhouse? And she said, um, no, he has his, a beautiful life there. He has his friends and his routine and his teachers. And I have my beautiful life. And I, and I also found that to be really true for myself, that I was able to bring my children to this place and feel good about them being there. 
And I didn't think about them the whole day. I thought about my students and I thought about my writing and I thought about the lunch that I was having, you know, like I wasn't constantly, you know, I, when I looked at their picture, they occurred to me, I missed them, but it wasn't like a, a, a constant, you know, heartbreak that they weren't with me at all time. The other thing about this daycare that was so special to me is that it was, it's a sliding scale daycare. And so it's for faculty, staff, and students. And economically, that meant that students who otherwise would not have been able to afford childcare and or go to school uh, because they had children were, were able to access this really excellent, uh, this excellent childcare service. And that enriched my children's lives, but it also enriched my life in that I met all sorts of people that, you know, because of the stratifications of our society, I certainly, you know, would have maybe, maybe run into them as students, but it's different when you meet someone as a fellow parent, uh, you know, through pizza parties and Halloween parades that you connect with another parent um, and, uh, you know, and really even playing field. Um, and so those are relationships that I continue to cherish and that I would not have otherwise perhaps developed if I had a nanny, for example, which if that's your thing, that's cool or whatever. I don't think that everybody has access to a place like the children's greenhouse. And I, I wish, I wish that for everyone who wants it again, not everybody wants it. Um, but I think that that is something that I have continued in, in my career to kind of always have kind of one toe in that in terms of some sort of activism or at least uh, continuing to discuss and talk about why this is so important. Um, and for me, it was a game changer as a parent. It was a game changer for me as a writer and an academic and for my partner as well. I, uh, I had more direct access with the childcare because it was on my campus, but I think that, you know, it, it enriched our entire family's life and made a lot of things possible that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I can't overstate how important childcare is or support even beyond childcare. Mm -hmm. And I've said this before, um, and you're making me sort of make a mental note in the next book to thank um, specifically my parents who throughout the pandemic have been helping with childcare when my daughter's daycare shut down due to COVID. Um, and we just decided to keep her home, which we couldn't have done had we not lived, you know, 15 minutes away from my parents who stepped in and every day so I could work from home and my husband could work um, out of the home at his job. They, they watched her and it's the only way I managed to get anything done. And I think um, being transparent about that is so mm -hmm. important because it seems, I think if you kind of hide the support that you have as a writer and a career professional, especially for women, there's this tendency to believe that like some women just are able to balance everything and others aren't. And that's totally not the case. It's all dependent on your support system. So thank you for saying that. Uh, I agree with what you're saying too. I think it's, yeah, it's important that we talk about it and acknowledge where we're, where we're getting this support from for sure. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And I, I feel so grateful and lucky for that. Um, as you, as you said about your, um, childcare. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about fostering, which, um, is a part of your bio. So you foster, um, continuously and you just had a four-year-old stay with you, right? We, we did. We did. Yeah. So, um, I'll preface this by saying that I, my parents had two foster children. So we were a foster, we, we fostered children as a family when I was a kid. It was a really different system. Um, I think that I'll just say kind of out of the gate that I think that the system itself is really dysfunctional. I think it's better than it was. Uh, I don't know, you know, that, that's tough. I don't know what, how much that says, but it's, it, it, it's better than it was. I do think that, that the moves that have been made just even the last 10 or 20 years in terms of really uh, prioritizing family reunification and just are, are are the right moves to make. And also just talking critically about the ways in which um, poverty is, is criminalized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was a kid, we had two foster children. Um, one was um, just for a few months, he was an older boy. And one was a girl who was uh, my age, we shared a room and she stayed with us for a year. And it's, I have so many complicated feelings about that. Uh, I think my parents did a lot of things right. I think it's really cool that they modeled for us that, you know, if you can, you should. And, um, you know, you, you can, if you have the resources to foster, you know, that that's, a, that's, that's something to consider. 
However, I would say they didn't talk to me or my brother a lot about, as far as my recollection goes, about what was happening or why it was happening or, or where the children went when they left. Other than um, I just knew that the girl who lived with us, who again was very close to a sister to me, I called her my sister. Um, I know that she went home to people that my parents weren't always talking about in positive ways. Um, and I think that that probably had more of an effect on me than I have really ever grappled with in terms of just, um, you know, that that kind of loss. I can only imagine how that was for her, you know, I, so I'm not trying to say, oh, poor me, I lost my foster sister. Um, but I do think it shaped and informed my decision later in life to to foster. Uh, I think that, in, in as I said earlier, it, it did model for me that this is possible in a way that I feel like a lot of folks I know, when we mention that we've become certified to be foster parents, are like, what? Why? And I think that the that question comes from a place of just not knowing anybody else who's ever fostered, right? Like, it's not an imaginable option because they haven't seen it or they don't know anybody. Now, I, that's just the community I'm living in right now. There's a lot of communities where people do all sorts of fostering not where I am right now. Um, so as, a, as adults, my partner, Jess, and I did uh, discuss fostering for a long time. Uh, and he also has his own, I won't speak on his behalf, but he, he has his own uh, interactions with uh, the, the system and, and had his eyes open about what we were getting ourselves into. And so we decided right before the pandemic to become certified. So of course, what wound up happening is it, it took like two and a half years. It took forever because, you know, it was like everything shut down and then it was going to be on Zoom, but like the department kind of wasn't equipped to do that. And so we became certified, I would say probably in maybe March of 2021. So pretty recently, uh, we had a placement this past summer. And, you know, and it, it, it it's hard to talk about because it's um, a situation, of course, that uh, is incredibly traumatic for a child. Mm -hmm. It, however, that said, I did feel good about our role in providing a safe and uh, I'd say loving environment for this child for the amount of time that she was in care. She was returned to family, so that's a positive outcome. And um, and it was uh, it was stressful in ways that I anticipated, and stressful in ways that I didn't anticipate. And I was surprised to find just how um, difficult it was in some ways. You know, I think that training is actually really good that you do to become a foster parent. And I learned a lot about the system and about children and about myself through the training. So, um, so you know, as much as we love to complain about things like trainings and certifications, I, I do think it is really valuable. Uh, but I don't know that anything really can prepare you for that moment when you get a phone call like, will you take this this child to live with you? You know, and are you ready to do that? Um, I think that one of the things that was most beautiful about it for, for me to see was uh, the way my children rose to the occasion. My, mm -hmm. my sons were like, so generous and big hearted about it in a way that, you know, like I know they're great kids. I think they're, you know, the best kids in the world. But, uh, you know, I, I was still kind of like, whoa, like you guys are, I can't even take credit for it. Like you guys are just awesome. You were just, they were just so cool and wonderful and um, loving. Now that was really like, it made all those hours of training worth it. And it, and it made kind of the sadness also that the attendant sadness <laughs> when the child left us, you know, because I think, um, you know, we were sad and we also were worried. Um, and uh, so that that part of it is, I think, t tough on my kids, but kind of bringing it back to my own experiences, like I am in their ear constantly talking about stuff. So hopefully we are we're at least managing it and talking about it in a way that um, is helpful and makes it kind of all make sense. Because I, I would kind of go back to this idea that, you know, when Jess and I talked initially about becoming foster parents, part of our rationale was like, you know, we are in a place in our lives where we we have the emotional and financial resources to do this. Not everybody does, but people with a lot less do it, you know, and if they can do it, what's what's stopping us? And I think that we really did feel like, okay, well, we, we can, so we should. And that um, I just uh, finished a, a really tremendous book, Sarah Centilli's Stranger Care, which is uh, a memoir about her experiences as a foster mother. Um, but it, I think, you know, if 
even if foster care is not interesting to you, I would say that this is such a beautiful and beautifully written book. It's worth reading just to kind of um, just engage with all of the different ideas that she is bringing up. So for example, first of all, I just want to say that she, I did the audio book, um, which was amazing. She reads it. And she, there's a couple times I might be wrong about this, but I felt like I could hear her like choking up. And I love that. I love, I mean, if I just felt like so authentic and like I was really, I, it felt like I, she felt like a friend in my head by the time I was finished. She probably was like, oh my God, this woman's obsessed with me. But it, I did, I, you know, you feel, you hear someone's voice for nine hours and it, and it does, it does feel, um, I feel like as though I really was able to, to, to be there with her. That said, I'm a better reader than listener probably. So like, I actually want to buy the hard copy so I can look at it again. But um, I feel as though, and again, this is my reading of her work, but I feel as though her thesis is sort of like, it's right there in the, in the title, Stranger Care, that we have to care for not just our genetically related uh, people. We have, to, we have to care for strangers as though they were our, our own children, our own genetically related children, right? And, um, and it's interesting because I feel like this, this author is kind of problematic, but I feel as though Flannery O'Connor is saying something similar in A Good Man is Hard to Find. She has that, that short story in which the end, I'm giving, so if you don't want to know what happens at the end, stop plug your ears for a second but when she looks at the misfit the criminal character and she says you're one of my own children you're one of my babies and i always teach that story as suggesting that if only we treated all people that we met as if they were our own babies right that we 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 extend to them the same care and desire to protect and nurture that we do for you know our own babies wouldn't this wouldn't that be a radically different world that we live in and I and I I kind of feel like that's what Centilles is getting at with her book that yes, biological relationship is important, right? And we should we should uh, we should respect the mother child or the father child relationship, but we also need to just res respect other humans as being our kin, regardless of, of of that of that biological or genetic relationship. So. Um, I, I suggested you, Lara, perhaps you'll have her on the show. I'll, I will listen with interest if uh, she comes on. Yes. And and I said, I, I love that idea. Um, I'm very interested in the in mothering in all capacities and all uh, from all perspectives. So, so just because someone is not a biological mother doesn't mean that they are not a mother. So or, you know, someone can be a mother of another person's child there there are a lot of variations so absolutely and thank you for that recommendation and that's a good moment to invite listeners to always send me suggestions of people you'd like to listen to or if you yourself are a writer mother um in any way shape or form please reach out um through the website writermothermonster.com and uh yeah Sarah, let's talk a little bit about your scholarship here and uh, the depictions of women, mothers, wives in media. Let's, I'm gonna just start broadly and say, tell me what that means. What do you look at? Well, uh, I mean, it's interesting. Even when I was in graduate school and I was doing a, a degree in American literature, I this is before I was a parent, I was interested in, and this was in part as a result of a prodding of a professor, a very cool professor named uh, Dale Bauer, who I had, uh, and she taught early American lit, but she, she brought to my attention the depiction of bad mothers in American lit. And I, I became fascinated at that point. And I, and I did some work on that when I was in graduate school, specifically in literature. But the bad news about studying something like bad moms in American lit is that they're kind of one dimensional. That there's, there's a lot of bad moms and they're all kind of, they all just kind of are bad moms. Like that's the bottom line about that. Um, but as I continued you know, to develop as a, as a scholar, I started becoming interested in, in representations of motherhood in pop culture. So again, what I found, well, the thesis of my book is basically that, um, thank you feminism, right? That, that because of the women's movement, we are now seeing more complex and nuanced depictions of women as wives and mothers in popular culture. Um, and part of the book looks at kind of the earlier depictions, which were really you know, written by men and were really pretty um, 
I'm interested in women's true lived experiences. And I think all you have to do now, I can give you some contemporary examples of this as well, but do you remember the old soap opera trope of like, they would have a baby and then like two months later, the kid would be like five. And, you know, like that, they used to happen on soap operas all the time. It's, it happens in science fiction still constantly that someone has this kind of mystical pregnancy. Uh, there's a scholar named Anita Sarkeesian who has a, uh, a, an interesting video on this. But in science fiction, you'll see someone get pregnant and then she'll have the baby. And then all of a sudden it's, it has an accelerated um, childhood. And this also happens in the movie Twilight. And it's interesting because these are mo what I'm listing, the exception of science fiction, but Twilight and, and General Hospital and soap operas, a lot of these are women's media. They're directed at women. And yet they completely skip over this part of a woman's experience that I argue, I could be wrong, but I argue that men just don't find that interesting. <laughs> so infancy and young childhood, which is so consuming for us, you know what I mean, when we're parents. I, you know, I started today by saying, you know, listen, it gets a lot easier. I, you know, I love my kids, but I'm not, they don't need me 24 seven anymore. Well, that wasn't always the case, obviously. But anyway, so this, this part of, of our lives that is just not that interesting, I guess, or wasn't that interesting to the people writing and directing uh, mass media. Uh, it, it, and again, it's something that kind of continues to be the case, I would say that we're seeing again, changes, but really those changes have come from feminist critics calling for, uh, for, for more interesting women characters. And also then of course, for calling for more representation behind the camera. So, uh, you know, the other thing that's interesting to think about is the ways in which streaming and YouTube and, uh, and, and TikTok have made content creation, have democratized content creation. Um, still, I mean, but in, even in Hollywood, you know, we're, we're seeing cooler stuff, right? We're seeing, Transparent and Insecure and Jane the Virgin and all of these shows with female showrunners, Shondaland, right, um, that are taking on concerns of wives and mothers in a much more serious and multidimensional way. So that's kind of what the book really talks about. It talks about um, the ways in which the kind of the earlier uh, depictions really are not that interesting. The later ones become more interesting, but also as they become interesting, they, they start to dramatize things like matrophobia. So that was Adrian Rich's idea that uh, women, young women live in fear of not, well, it, it is the idea of becoming one's mother and that old cliche, like, I don't want to turn into my mother. But the reason that women would fear becoming their mothers is because they saw quote unquote, the binding rags that their mothers lived with. They saw their mothers as disempowered, often oppressed, often as perhaps even geniuses with passions and talents who had to uh, really tamp down their in own interests in order to fit in or to uh, to fulfill whatever roles they felt they needed to uh, to fulfill. So so Rich is talking about metrophobia, and I, I do see that as something that... Um, persists, you know, or that, it, that some media is, is taking on and dealing with in interesting ways. And then I also talk about how um, Susan Douglas has a wonderful book called Enlightened Sexism, in which she talks about how media sometimes errs too far on the other side, where every show has a, fe a black female president, right? Which would be awesome, right? But is, is not necessarily uh, an accurate reflection of kind of where we are at I mean, we're all, we almost have a black female person, but it's not an it was at least five years ago wasn't an accurate reflection of where we were at as a country. So, uh, kind of this overly optimistic idea of of how things have changed for women, which is also one dimensional in some ways. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there's so much to unpack there. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was thinking. Um, I was reflecting as you were walking us through that about in my own writing. Um, if I leave that gap, right, between the infant and the, the mm -hmm. older child. And I think I do. And then I'm like, well, why do I do that? And I think um, when you said that that early motherhood is so all consuming, mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the, the idea that from a craft perspective, does that make it more difficult, do you think, to tell a story about a woman within all of her complexity if that period of motherhood is so consuming that often other interests have to fall aside for a while like does that how does that affect story or how have you seen it affect or impact narrative as shows have 
allowed for more complexity and grappled with that period of a woman's um, mothering? Well, I do think that there's a lot to unpack in that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I think, for example, the show Catastrophe, for example, I don't know if, if you guys have seen that one, but that's one I think that kind of gets into the shit, right? It gets into like the, the sticks, right, of, of early parenthood, if I remember correctly. So I don't think it's impossible to, to depict necessarily. I think that as writer mothers, though, uh, I do think it, it's kind of like um, to go back to childcare. I remember when my kids were at daycare, you know, having all of this kind of uh, my friend Stella and I being just so charged up about, about universal daycare, but we were so exhausted. <laughs> Jeremy, we were working full time and writing and raising little kids. And we just didn't, we weren't going to Albany to, you know, to talk about how important it is for community colleges to have childcare on campus. And then when your kids are out of daycare and you get a little more sleep, it's not as pressing anymore. It's not as urgent, right? So maybe it, that's kind of what we're talking about too, a little bit in the sense that when we're living with little kids, we aren't necessarily, we don't have the energy to be writing about living with little kids. And then when we're not living with little kids, we have the energy to write about other stuff. Like that doesn't, again, seem as urgent, which could account for some of, some of that, maybe that why it's not. I mean, the other answer to that is that infancy to a, to an outsider is maybe not that interesting. So I'm like my baby's every burp and, and gurgle is not is, is fascinating to me, but may not be fascinating to an audience. So how do you make that fascinating? And I, I think that the, I, I, they're not springing to mind, but I think you, you can make that fascinating. I just read Jessica Winter's The Fourth Child, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic and it's beautifully written. And I think she does a really interesting and beautiful job with pregnancy and early childhood in that in that book. So that would be a recommendation I have for a great depiction of what it's like to have a little baby. And I think in that, that the book is complicated and has a lot of this four different children in it, but the, the first child uh, that the protagonist has, you know, she's like, it's a, it's a love story. You know, she's in love with being pregnant. She's in love with this infant, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, other things happen, <laughs> but, uh, but again, that would be, a, I'd put that out there as a, a nuanced, beautiful depiction of early childhood. Thank you. Yes, I would love to read more of those. <laughs> I think we should we'll start a list. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so this is a bit of a tangent, but I, I want to ask you, since I have you here and we're talking about pop culture representations of wives and mothers, um, tell me a bit more, or tell me, I guess, about this trope of the wife and mother who has it all together and she's sort of the, um, the type A in the household, right? And then she has this sort of slobby husband. So I'm thinking like home improvement or everyone loves Raymond, you know, that um, modern family, even like the central couple there, the, the dad's a bit of a schlub and the mom's this like type A. Tell me about this. I, well, I'll say, I mean, it's, I'm shaking my head. I, I think it's really sexist and I think that it's uh, unfortunate. And I think that um, I, get, I think it comes from a place where as a culture, we do have expectations on girls and women that they are going to be all of these things, sometimes contradictory things, you know, all at the same time. So, you know, you if you just think about how we treat teenage girls, uh, they should be incredibly sexy, but then, you know, they shouldn't be sluts, right? And, and moms need to be consumed with their children, but also be sexy, right? And also be... Um, uh, you know, incredible decorators and uh, great organizers and CEOs, right? I, I do, I have an article, um, and this is again, just who I am. And I think it's really cool. If you are into decorating, that's fantastic. And I, my hat is off to you and I, and please give me your advice because it's not an interest of mine. And uh, I can't tell you how many times, again, I live in kind of a an affluent suburb at this point. And I've been asked many, many times of like, when I'm getting my Christmas tree up or what I'm making for Thanksgiving. And I always say like, I just think of me like a husband because I don't do any of that stuff. And neither does my partner. So in fact, we don't, I mean, he cooks, he's great, but uh, he doesn't like decorate for Halloween or anything. Um, he also is Jewish, so he wouldn't decorate for Christmas. So what I'm getting at, I guess, is that I don't, I don't, do that stuff. I don't feel bad about not doing this. Stuff. It's not interesting to me. I have other, you know, there's other weird interests that I have that I need to pursue and not decorating. 
Um, long story short, though, that I think that a lot of women uh, are, are brainwashed to believe that this isn't more important than it is. And if they don't, if you, I just want to, I'm here to tell you, if you don't like doing it, don't do it. The world will keep spinning. The world, will, and if you like doing it, that's awesome and come to my house next. But if you don't like to do it, you don't have to do it. I think that, um, you know, it's, I think that there's an enormous amount of pressure on women. And I think that what the pop culture, or sometimes what we hear is like, let's blame feminism. Let's blame feminism because women now have to be beautiful into their 60s and have kids and be CEOs. Let's not blame feminism. Feminism had it right back in the 70s. We just haven't caught up right? Uh, I, I, again, I think that um, I would call it neoliberal post-feminism. This idea that you are on your own. The only people you need to worry about are yourself and your family. And that means that uh, really that, that, that it, it comes back to this kind of scarcity mentality that capitalism wants us to have. Um, that I have to work and protect my own. And, and if anybody else has any other demands, it's going to be taken away from me. And I think that we do see this in, in um, I think we see it, and I'm not going to get too political, but I would say if, if your justification for voting a certain way is that uh, it lowers your taxes for your kids, um, you know, I think you have to ask a question about like, well, what kind of community do you want to be living in, right? Do we want to live in a society in which it's, it really is, it's just about me and my family and I don't care about anybody else. Um, it kind of seems like we, a lot of us have really internalized that, that thinking. Yeah. And shout out to my friend Fiona, cause she always talks about, she always talks about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I love that answer. Yeah. And you do hear that, blame it on feminism. It's the, the feminist snowflakes and mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, <laughs> well, I, I just saw a TikTok. I'm, I'm totally into TikTok. I think it's awesome. Uh, I, the, whatever the TikToks I watch are, are the content is amazing and smart and really cool and also uplifting. But I, I saw somebody making fun of a TikTok in which, and I don't, you know, I don't really want to make fun of other women, but it was like, I just want to stay home and raise my family and and thanks feminism for ruining that for me. And it's, and what's cool about TikTok is that there were multi-layered analyses of this, which, you know, one woman was like, you can stay home. Feminists would support that choice. And that's true. Feminists would still ask you to think critically about where where that choice is coming from and the and the different ways you've been indoctrinated to believe both that that is what you want to do as well as you're not allowed to do it you know or, or we're, there's, there's a couple layers there that again I wouldn't blame feminism I, I would blame capitalism if you you know if you want to be a full time parent but you can't that's not because the feminists are telling you you can't that's because you know minimum wage doesn't uh, doesn't allow one to live you know, uh, to live in this country. Um, so there's a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so sneaky when you internalize it and you don't, like you said, ask critically where this uh, belief is coming from. And I remember, and I probably have shared this before in this podcast, but the sense where I don't believe that um, a person, that a woman should keep her house spotless when they at, at all like it anybody, but especially if you have kids, like the, where's that pressure coming from? And yet when I had my daughter, the day after I got home, I cleaned my house and I started bleeding again. I was like, what? And it, yeah. And it was just this sense, like no one told me that I needed to clean my house yeah. and I knew I didn't have to clean my house, but there was some internal drive of like, I need to have everything together. I need to like you know, be in control of my surroundings. I can't just let everything fall apart because I'm home with a new child. And it was that sense of like not wanting to be a mess, you know, mm -hmm. like the messy mom thing. But looking at that critically, when I could take a step back, I was like, oh my God, like where did that come from? Why did I do that? And it is, it's heartbreaking when you think about the, I mean, that's just a one little example of something, but the fact that we put this pressure on ourselves and sometimes don't even realize it. I hope that you're not hard on yourself though, when you think about that, because I, I am. Mean, yes. I mean, if, if someone else told you that story though, I think that you, your heart would break for them, but maybe not for the same reasons. I think your, yeah. your hormones were going bananas and you felt out of control. And that reminds me of your last guest, Sheba talking about how much of parenthood is 
is beyond our control and how terrifying that can be, you know? Yeah. yeah. So and a, that new baby coming home. Oh my God. Yeah. And your, your body's out of your control. Just everything is blown up. So if you're sort of like a, an anal retentive person, it's like, well, at least I can clean my floor and like whatever. But anyway, which is also though, I, I think that maybe she talked about this in the last episode as well, but it also is a flaw in our, in our social safety net that we're sending, you know, I, again, I have a great partner and, and hooray, we were together, but um, no, I didn't have a visiting nurse. We couldn't afford uh, any sort of extra help at that point in our lives. So, you know, if I had needed help cleaning or if we had needed any sort of help or if either of us were not up for the task for whatever, for, you know, because of disability, illness, work, whatever, you know, we would have been really in a terrible situation. It's, and it was incredibly lonely and isolating yeah. to, uh, to, you know, just come home to that apartment with this little baby and like no instructions again we had done our homework, but we still, I remember this is like, we talk about this fondly now, but we had a bassinet with a hand-me-down bassinet and it was a rocking bassinet. So we took this tiny little newborn and we put him in the bassinet and then we couldn't sleep because we were terrified that he was going to move and the bassinet would fall over. Yeah. Because we, we had never used this before. So first we were like taking turns, staying up and like watching. And then, then we were shoving towels under the legs of the bassinet, you know, to make sure it didn't turn over. I think the next day after the haze of the night before we realized like there were like little locks on the bottom so that it wouldn't, but the, the long story short is, first of all, he was literally one day off. He was not rolling. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like nothing was happening there that was really dangerous, but we were so unequipped and crazed because we were sleep deprived and my hormones are going crazy. And maybe his were too, you know, like it was just such a, a, a storm <laughs> and, um, Again, there's there's just not a lot of like you just kind of have to figure it out, which thankfully we did, and most people do, and we all thank God made it, you know, after that first night. I don't know that we should have had to though. Mm -hmm. And now again, I would say, you know, I'm fortunate in that I my parents are still living. They weren't those grandparents who were like coming over, like, I'm gonna stay over so you can sleep, you know. So it wasn't like they neither of us had parents that were doing that. Um, so we were kind of on our own and uh, we were adults. <laughs> we were educated adults and we were still so completely over our heads, you know? Yeah. No, that, yes, that resonates with me too. Um, and this is, again, a slight tangent, but I remember the most terrified and out of control I'd ever felt was when um, the winter after my daughter was born. So she was maybe like four or five months old. And there was this terrible flu going around and I got it first and I was completely incapacitated. And she was barely, I think it four months, maybe like they're kind of sitting up, you know, mm -hmm. I don't even remember at this point, but they're, they're not very, they can't do anything yet. Mm -hmm. So she's still breastfeeding. She's still, and I was like, what do I do? And I was completely incapacitated. My husband was watching her, but then two days later, he got the flu, the same oh. one. And we were both again incapacitated <laughs> and we were in boston at the time so thank god again for my parents they came to boston and they spent the night and they just watched her they brought her to me when she was hungry and all the things for like two days until one of us recovered enough to take care of her but the sense of like if you both get sick that mm -hmm. fear of not being able to like you don't have a support structure as you said beneath you um, or when you come home from the hospital mm -hmm. after being discharged after like the most traumatic thing that happens to your body, you know, yeah. barring a car accident or something. So yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I think I like to believe I might be wrong about this, but I think things are changing. I think that we do have more visiting nurses, but I think it's because of these conversations. I think it's because women are like, wait a second, this is not okay. <laughs> we need to make some changes. Cause um, I, I do think that I had a friend who recently had a, a baby and I think, you know, she had a nurse like two days later come to her home. And I was like, that's awesome. Like, that's what we need. We need that stuff. Cause we talk a good talk about it takes a village, but um, sometimes, you know, we really are so uh, in our, in our little, in our lanes that I don't know that the village is there for a lot of folks, you know? No, yeah, 
Totally. And often that aftercare is so focused on the baby too. I mean, that's a whole other thing we could talk about, but a visiting nurse who comes and spends equal attention on both the Mm -hmm. child and the mother who just gave birth is so, so vital. So I'm glad your friend had that experience. Um, But let's, so we could talk about this forever, but let's (laughs) shift gears a little bit and talk about YA fiction. Yeah, total change. I actually, um, you know, it's interesting because we were talking about the academic work and my, my academic work and fiction kind of unfolded at the same time. And I, I guess for the first part of my writing career, I was really focused on scholarly work. And um, it actually, when, when my, my first son was born, I had always wanted to do fiction, but I think, I think that really provided kind of the kick in the pants that I needed in the sense that I was like, okay, well, um, if I'm going to do it, I got to do it like now because I'm, I'm mortal. <laughs> and um, interestingly, kind of, again, returning to something we talked about before, my time was no longer limitless. And I think that um, it having the daycare structure was really important for me, too, because what I wound up doing was just being really, really, perhaps obsessively uh, so, but really structured with my time. So, uh, you know, again, instead of like, let's watch a movie before we go to bed tonight and then I'll get up early and jog like our life that, as you know, you have kids and that, that changes really dramatically. And um, then I, when I was paying for childcare, it changed again. Cause then it was like, you know, I'm not going to mess around. I'm not going to look at Facebook for an hour if I'm paying $20 an hour to have my kid in childcare. Um, listen, there's no problem if that's what you do to relax. I'm not, no judgment. I'm just saying that was my thought process was like, I'm paying for childcare. I need to, you know, squeeze every every minute out of this that I can. So uh, I became really focused on on making sure that I was writing every day, and uh, which is kind of a reversal. You know, again, I think a lot of times people are like, well, when you have kids, it goes out the window. I'd say six months. Yeah, I didn't do anything, and then when he started childcare, I started really writing pretty seriously, and um, and I really, you know, listen, I, I love my YA book, If It I Murphy. I, I don't think it's a perfect novel. But I did try to implement some of what I wanted to see. So like on the one hand, I was writing this scholarly work about what I wasn't seeing or critiquing some of what I was seeing in our pop culture. And then at the same time, I was writing this book that I was hoping would in fact maybe remediate some of that, right? You know, uh, we do, so in, in some ways, you know, like that was, it was really great to be doing both at the same time. Um, and. It's interesting, though, now, too, with my second YA novel, though, I think any sort of principles that I had with the first one kind of went out the way. I was like, oh, this one's just going to be fun. You know, like, I, there's no message. Well, I guess there's a message. But, you know, there's no, like, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't trying to hit my certain markers. Whereas with Ivy and I Murphy, and I think if, if folks read it, and some people really like this about, I mean, nobody has told me they hated it about the book, but some people have given me feedback that they really appreciate the book, that it's it's a feminist YA, or it's attempting to be a feminist YA. Um and it, it's deeply invested in the idea of mothers and daughters and exploring those relationships. Um, but again, with my second YA, it's a little bit more, there's also a, a problematic mother-daughter relationship in that one, but it's much more, it's like a 80s paranormal bullying, Twilight Zone meets Heathers meets Stanford prison experiment kind of <laughs> thing. So it's, it's definitely uh, less serious in some ways. Yeah, so I'm really fascinated by that shift. Um... And sort of the movement of, not that you aren't grappling with issues in the second book, but like this movement of feeling deeply that you you have a, a message or points that you mm-hmm. wanted to hit, like you said. And then was it a sense of allowing yourself to have fun with the second book or was it a more, like, was that a conscious decision or was it sort of like, do the story, yeah, was it a conscious decision? Yeah, I, it, it's interesting that you asked that. It wasn't a conscious decision, but I do, as as you're asking me to reflect on it, I would say that uh, there was confidence. I had more confidence in kind of like, okay, I can, I can do this as opposed to the first book, which, you know, I, I was embarking on something brand new. Um, And so I was really kind of very strategic in the ways that I was putting that together. Whereas the second one, again, I, I was kind of like worst case scenario, like, it sits in a draw. Like I did, I already published a book. So I I feel good about that. You know, like this one, if it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't go anywhere. I'll write a third, you know, like I felt I had more just kind of uh, energy and, and 
uh, enthusiasm for just kind of like trying as opposed to the first one, which I kind of really just wanted to get it right, which in some ways, you know, just kind of, I don't know, looking at your own work, when you look back, I wonder if maybe in some ways my attempts to get it right with Iphigenia Murphy, if I was writing that book again now, if I would, if I would maybe take different kinds of risks. Um, whereas, you know, with, uh, with, with more recent writing, it is kind of like, I, I did what I set out to do. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit more liberated to kind of like this try stuff now. And I, I guess I've always been kind of, um, like I'm always, I'm very curious, uh, about trying, you know, in terms of how things work. So I actually, I was in a writing group recently and I was talking to someone in the group and she mentioned trying to write a, a specific kind of film. And, and for me, it's, it's a similar kind of challenge. Like now I'm trying to work on like a mystery. I don't know if it'll work. I've never written a mystery before, right? But I'm kind of like interested in seeing how you put that together. It's kind of like a puzzle and kind of reading a lot of mysteries and, and taking them apart and then seeing if I can put something like that together. So it's, it's kind of the challenge. And I feel like that's kind of what started with YA it was like, I was like, I want to write a, YA, a feminist YA. So I, I did that. And then the next one, it was like, I want to write a paranormal YA, <laughs> you know, and I kind of just tried to put something like that together. So that's been the trajectory. I've also written some kind of uh, adult uh, fiction. So I have that novella that um, I, that I, I may I'm I'm it might be interested in turning into a novel. I don't know. I, I those I don't know if you feel like this about any of your characters, but the characters in that novella have just stayed with me. They, I and it feels weird to it, to talk about your own work this way, but I feel like I know them, and I feel like I have to return to them in some way. Um, so. So they're kind of calling to me to do something with that. Do you ever do you ever feel like that? Like, are there any characters like that? That that one story they just they're sticky. They're sticky. You can't you can't put them down. Yeah, I think so. I think for me, it's less a character and more a like a theme or a mm -hmm. a, a kernel of a story that that repeats and it it's coming out in different ways. And I'm trying to not find the right way, but like the the way of telling it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. sure. If it's like getting older, if, if it's about me getting older, I mean, or like life experience changes, what the story's about or what have you, but it's kind of interesting. And I'm always intrigued by how people approach a new work. And to hear you say you approach something as um, sort of like a, a challenge to yourself, maybe in some ways, like, oh, here's a, what if I write a mystery? Let's figure out how it works, deconstruct it and then build mm -hmm. one of my own. And I love that concept. And I, I've heard others say something similar. Some people start with characters, some people start with who knows what, but um, yeah, that resonates with me too. I think I I have an unpublished novel that I wrote. It was a YA novel many years ago and it was definitely grappling with, um, I had a message and I wanted to say something. And like you, I was very strategic about how it fit together. And I think it suffered from um, over working where it was like how does this piece fit with this piece but it taught me a lot about writing a longer piece of fiction and now it's more like mood driven where the the newest book i'm like i want to write something feminist and angry so that's that's yeah. the book. And now i'm writing a project that's like nostalgic and um um gets into like desire so mm -hmm. you know, it's it's interesting Wait, so to yourself. is animal wife the feminist and angry one it is not although it could certainly be considered feminist and angry <laughs> that was really driven more by um grappling with my own questioning about whether i wanted to become a mother mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um following various scenarios into mm -hmm. motherhood and and wifehood but anyway neither here nor there, but let's go back to you and YA. And um, you're turning Iphigenia into a screenplay, right? So I, you know, so I read Courtney Malm's book uh, and that was like, everybody was reading it about a year ago. Um, I think it's after the book deal, maybe it was called, uh, before, before and after the book deal. And, and her advice was, uh, you know, adapt your own work. So I took her advice and it kind of like a puzzle. I said, okay, well, can I do this? And um, I, I could, I, I think, Again, I uh, I have some some questions about whether or not how effectively I've done it, but it did it pretty good. I've I've entered it into a couple of screenwriting festivals, and it's it's done nicely. You know, I, I didn't, yeah. So so that's been heartening, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean it will ever be made into a movie. And in fact, you know, I don't know that that's 
really um, a, uh, like, a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, however, you know, like, again, it was, it was fun to write and, and it is interesting to do because it, um, you know, you are in some ways reverse engineering your own work from a different perspective. So like early feedback I got on it when I first put the screenplay together was like, this is way too novelistic. Like, you know, kind of getting away from the, like, she knows that she'll be leaving that afternoon. So she's very worried. Like you can't do that. You can really just kind of give dialogue in very minimal parenthetical, you know, she puts it down, she's frowns, she's crying, whatever. Um, so, so that was just, it was, it was an interesting and fun exercise. And it did teach me a lot about kind of, I think my own story and my storytelling. Um, probably would have been valuable to do before it was published too, but, uh, so, but we'll, you know, I'm going to continue to, to, um, I think I'll probably continue to like, maybe to try to shop it around a little bit. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think, uh, it, it, it's also something again that I did cause I necessarily was like, okay, this is, this is, I'm not a screenwriter. That's, you know, not necessarily my calling, but, but it was kind of a, an interesting exercise and, and it was more fun than I thought it would be. That sounds like a fascinating process. Um, tell me a little bit, can you, can you give an example of like a moment or a scene or, um, or, yeah, something that you, somewhere that felt sticky where you had to kind of shift the the book in or the narrative from a mm -hmm. novel into a screenplay and and how you kind of like draw out how you how you did that well so for example the book starts i believe if i'm remembering correctly it starts off with kind of uh the main character if you waking up and getting ready to run away from home but the the film the way i wrote the film starts with her in a high school classroom first of all kind of daydreaming and and not daydreaming but actually kind of having a, like a flashback of some trauma and then and then there's like one two three and this is again it, i i think it works really well in the screenplay she gets kind of runs into three different occasions of kind of harassment or belittlement so she comes she meets her a high school teacher talks to her in a weird way it's not overtly horrible but it just vaguely creepy. Then she goes to meet her best friend who's being basically sexually harassed by these guys. And then they're, they're going to a playground and someone cat calls them. So they're, they're not like over the head, but they're the idea of the kind of indignities that teenage girls are just actually so accustomed to often. Um, and the idea is that these, this is, this is kind of, um, leading up to kind of a, a much more extreme situation that she's in at home, then that's why she has to run away from home. And the idea that home, when she runs away, she's a runaway and that the, most of the book is set in Forest Park, Queens, which is a wooded city park um, and it's in the nineties. And the idea is that even as dangerous as it is to live in a park, it's actually better than living at home. It's it's less dangerous than the situation she was in at home. And in fact, she has more freedom and is less persecuted kind of on her own in the park than she was in this other situation. Now, the problem, of course, with the book going to a screenplay is that then a huge portion of the book is her alone in the park, you know, not in dialogue. And that is, is tricky to translate. Um, and I probably want to condensing that section, you know, in terms of and then getting more into some of the adventures and uh, other characters a little bit sooner than maybe happens in the book. So, you know, there, there were big changes in that way, like all of those things that happened, the cat calling. I think that's not even in the book. You know what I mean? But it, I wanted to kind of set this stage before kind of delving into why she was running away from home. So that would be, I think, you know, an example of how it really had to, to be altered in order to translate it. Did you learn anything um, about writing fiction from writing the screenplay version? Like, would you, if, I think it's unfair to ask if you were to go back to the novel and change anything based on what you learned from the screenplay, but like for your next book, did you, what did you learn about writing for film or television that you might apply to your novels? So, well, I, I do want to say that I think I definitely would change my book. And the, the thing about it is that I don't know if you have this experience, but every time I've ever done a, like a live reading, <laughs> I'm always like, oh, I should, I should have done this. Right. And sometimes I actually will do that. Like if I'm getting ready for the reading, I'll like I'll change a couple, even things I love. Like so I just I recently did a reading from the novella. And, you know, again, I, I really like that piece. But there were just some clunky phrases that I I penciled in changes so that when I did the reading, like I was revising this published piece. And I, I actually was telling, it was students and I told them, you know, 
Um, Cause uh, one of the questions in the Q and A was like, well, how many times do you revise something? I was like, I revise literally hundreds of times. Yeah. Um, and I said, and I'm revising right, this this is published and I'm revising it right now. And if, it, if I wind up publishing it somewhere else, it will be a revised version. So you're never done, you're never done. Um, so I certainly felt that way about when I was revisiting the novel to work on the screenplay. The other thing I, I do think, you know, listen, I, there's a lot of wonderful craft books and this one is not everyone's favorite, but I do think that Save the Cat and Save the Cat Writes a Novel are both really valuable if folks are looking for um, uh, books that really break. And because that's as I kind of suggested, I, I like that stuff when we break it down, when we look at the beats, when we look at how the sausage is made. And those are books that that do that. Right. So the most recent one, Save, Save the Cat Writes a Novel, um, talks about specifically genre based pattern. So if you're writing a mystery, this is what we usually see. And here are some examples from uh, from literature. And it's, I teach creative writing. And I was just telling my students the other day that the title Save the Cat, I might be mangling this. So forgive me, authors, I forgot their names, if, I, if I'm getting this wrong. But the idea of Save the Cat is that when you have a protagonist, even if the protagonist is kind of a villain or a bad person, you have to give them a moment that we can identify with them so that we're going to root for them. So you give them a Save the Cat moment. And I, I said this because in the very first episode of Squid Game, which I'm mean, not giving anything away, but in the first episode of Squid Game, there's the, the protagonist who, I wouldn't say he's unlikable, but he doesn't have that many redeeming qualities. But there's a moment in that first episode where he has a little bit of fish and he gives it, he gives it to a stray cat. And it's like, <laughs> it's like exactly what I'm talking about. Like all of a sudden it, it makes him, you know, it, it, it demonstrates that he can, he can have uh compassion beyond and he's not completely in here which again kind of goes back to some of our earlier conversations about it's not just about just me 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 but kind of seeing beyond yourself a little bit to to we yeah i think that's a beautiful place to end actually <laughs> since we've come full circle and come back to from me to we and that was that was beautifully said. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Sarah, for joining me. This has just been oh, such a pleasure. I, I know I could talk to you all night. You're wonderful. And I look forward to hearing your voice in my head on my jobs and when I'm doing the dishes <laughs> in the future. Thank you, Sarah. Well, you have to come back with the next book and, and talk oh, some more. You. And um, it's been just such a pleasure. So please join me in thanking Sarah, um, those of you who are watching from home and anyone listening after the fact, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, and thanks, Sarah. Thank you. And thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, please, as always, consider becoming a patron or patroness of Writer Mother Monster to help me keep the podcast going. And you can find a link to the Patreon page on writermothermonster.com. Also, right now, I will mention that we have a special um, merch item, a notebook, a Writer Mother Monster notebook. And if you journal or just love notebooks as much as I do, please check it out. You can find that link again on writermothermonster.com under merch um, or on any of the social handles. And that is my pitch for merch tonight, my awkward pitch. So thank you so much again for joining me. Please come back again next week. And until then, have a lovely week.